Hey guys, Dr. Alex here, and we're here with another Better Ever After podcast. And on this podcast, or if you're watching us on Facebook, we're going to be talking all about pain. And we're going to be talking about pain science, doing a small introduction, because if you've been paying attention, pain and the medications like Oxycontin around pain are on the news lately. And I think having an understanding of pain is really important for your health. It's going to allow you to make better decisions. I think it's a really interesting and cool topic and really important to understand some of the underpinnings of when you feel pain, what does it actually mean? I'm going to give you some tips of how to generally feel less pain. And we're going to talk about how pain is in the brain, the issue isn't the tissue. And that's one of my favorite sayings that I picked up from uh, an acupuncture instructor. So let's talk about pain. Pain is a really good evolutionary tool and it's something that we require in order to survive. So pain is going to tell us if something is going to potentially threaten our survival and limit our ability to pass on our genes. That would be the evolutionary history of it. Meaning that if you get too close to the fire, it could burn you, get an infection, kill you. If you step on something, it's going to tell you that, hey, there's something in your foot. You might want to take that out before you get an infection. It's going to tell you if something is potentially wounded and maybe you shouldn't be running on it. And so we've evolved to experience pain. And this is really important for the purpose that it might threaten our survival. Because ultimately, we've evolved to pass along our genes. And our brain, for the most part, is a few thousand, if not a few million years old. So let's talk about, and I'm going to look at my notes occasionally just because I want this to be as clear as possible. So that's why we feel pain. In terms of some practical information, some babies, it's possible to be born without pain, and, and those babies, unfortunately, they often die. And if you know anybody in your life that has diabetes, you can lose the pain sensation in your hands, but especially in your feet. And if you lose the pain sensation in your feet, uh, it can kill you at, at you know, a less severe, or less awful thing. You can lose your foot or your leg because you can get a cut, you don't feel it, you don't know to take care of it because you can't feel any pain, and it can get infected, and you know sometimes you have to have it, it amputated. So feeling pain is actually a really good and really, really important thing. Now, in terms of how pain works, it's really interesting. There's actually no such thing in the body as a pain nerve or a pain receptor. There's what called our nociceptors. So nociceptors are things that detect noxious or you think of bad stimulus on the body that could threaten our survival. Temperature, chemicals, uh, and me mechanical pain like, like a cut or someone punching you. And these nociceptors, when they get enough of an input, whether it's enough sharpness or enough heat or enough chemical or enough of a whack, they send a signal up to the brain. And this signal up to the brain through the nociceptors, it's going to tell the brain that, hey, there's something that's potentially problematic going on that you might need to pay attention to that might threaten your survival. But then it's the brain's job to figure out, is this painful? Is this a problem? So when I said earlier that pain is in the brain, and you maybe heard that awful saying that it's all in your head, it technically is, or at least it's technically all in your nervous system. Because when that nociceptive signal reaches your brain, your brain has to figure out, is this painful? Is this something that I've encountered before, or something that's going to threaten my survival? Do I need to worry about this? And if the answer is yes, it will tell your conscious mind, hey, something's painful, or at the very least, hey, something's getting warm, or something's getting chemically, or something's getting sharp and punchy and you should pay attention to this. And so because that interpretation occurs in the brain in a number of different centers, there's a ton of different things that can infect, affect if you feel pain or, or if that pain actually occurs. And then another ton of factors if that acute injury or that acute pain becomes more chronic pain, which is, is a really big problem in our society. So in terms of that pain processing in the brain, there's a lot of different things that can affect it. It can be affected by your mood. It can be affected by things such as depression or anxiety. It can be affected by things like how much sleep you've had. 
It can be affected by things such as drugs, like alcohol or some other mind-altering substance like CBD or THC. And you'll notice that you know when you are intoxicated, if you've ever had an injury, things feel less painful. And we know from the field of cr uh, chronic pain that certain behaviors, certain interactions with other people, and even your job satisfaction, these are all factors that can affect your pain level. So there's a lot of things that can affect one's pain level, and that's why in the office, it's very interesting. You could have a shift in the spine or a particular issue that's objectively bad, and two people will experience it or feel it in two very different ways, often depending on how their brain works, how their nervous system processes it, and also what's going on in their life. So another couple of factors that can affect pain and how you interpret it, beyond what we just discussed going on in the brain, is the health of the signal or the nervous system between the nociceptor, say, in your elbow and its pathway up to the brain. We know that if there's more inflammation in the body in general, we know if there's more stress on the nervous system or more changes in the nervous system or in the nerves and in the spine that are affecting that signal's journey on the way up or the way that it's interpreted, you can feel more or less pain. So it's a really complicated topic. It's a really complicated subject. And there's so many factors that go into, hey, my elbow hurts. So I think a really good example, we'll talk about the elbow. We're going to talk about tennis elbow or lateral epicondylalgia. So we don't call it tennis elbow anymore. We call it lateral epicondylalgia, which in English or non-Latin means pain at the outside of the elbow. So we know for some really good research that when somebody has tennis elbow or lateral epicondylalgia, they often have multiple issues going on. It's a really cool thing and it's often a reason why we have such good success with this condition in our office because I tackle all of these things. So, you know, you have pain here in the elbow, whether it's from tennis or golf or just typing too much. And usually what we find is there's an issue in the tissue. There's some degeneration, there's some potential micro tearing, there's some inflammation, and that is enough to potentially cause a nociceptive signal up to the brain. That can take days, weeks, years to build up. What we also notice from the research is that there's often changes in the nervous system at the location of the elbow. It becomes more sensitized, more sensitive to pain. And we also notice changes in those nerves and in the spinal cord, making the spinal cord more sensitive to pain. So what, how we know this is that, let's say you have tennis elbow on one side. If you press on the other side, it's actually going to be more sensitive than it otherwise should be to pain because there's a change here in the middle in the spinal cord. It's more sensitive to detecting pain. And we also notice that with lateral epicondylalgia or tennis elbow, there's often, and this is very well established, often a really significant problem or changes in the neck putting additional stress on the nerves that go up to the brain that make that nociceptive or pain signal even stronger by the time it reaches the brain. So in a case of lateral epicondylalgia or tennis elbow, you have to tackle the issue with the tissue, you have to tackle the spine and the nerves that travel up, and often you have to tackle uh, what's happening in the brain or at least the global nervous system. So that's why a comprehensive approach in all aspects of care, but especially one of those, is really, really important. And that goes for almost everything, whether it's knee pain, spine pain, neck pain. If you just deal with the potential issue in the tissue, uh, like that, that issue or that pain might never go away. And so in terms of talking about pain, I think it's really, really important that we talk about we've talked about the purpose of pain, but we talk about its interpretation and what it actually means. So I really like giving the example um, of, of my father having a heart attack at 50 or 55 and you know he woke up that day feeling good, looking good, uh, and he almost died. Thankfully he did not and he's in very good health now. But we often have this tendency to judge our health on how we look and how we feel. And the problem with that is the same for whether it's a heart attack or tennis elbow. In terms of my father's case, he had been probably unhealthy for 15 or 20 years. Plaque had been building up in the arteries. He'd been developing dysfunction 
in the cardiovascular system, that dysfunction or that unhealthiness eventually became a condition where if you did some testing, you would see that he had cardiovascular disease. And then eventually it became a symptom when there was a 95% blockage. So in his case, problem, sorry, in his case, bad lifestyle, problem, measurable problem, symptoms. And what you can see is the symptoms came at the very end. And whether we're talking about heart attack or whether we're talking about tennis elbow, lateral epicondylalgia, or we're talking about back pain, the process is almost universally the same across all of health. It starts with a problem or dysfunction. And as soon as that problem or dysfunction becomes measurable, you can apply a name to it or a condition. And then eventually, by the time it hits a certain threshold, either the nociceptive fiber sending a big enough signal or the brain becoming sensitive enough, eventually you interpret it as pain. And so you see the problem here. When we judge ourselves based on how we look and how we feel, and how we feel, we're waiting for that last outcome that, hey, there's a problem here that potentially could threaten your survival. And, and that might be okay if your definition of health is living. However, my definition of health is the, and the, uh, the actual technical definition of health is the optimal function of all the cells and all the tissues in the body. And that includes both the brain and the body. And so as soon as you start to move from optimal function away, that's where the disease process begins. And so if we're just judging ourselves based on how we, how we look and how we feel, we're missing the initial changes that are eventually going to lead to that problem. And so in terms of practical application for this, this is where testing, whether it's either with your physician or with your chiropractor or your manual therapist, testing is really, really important to measure the function because when you start to see changes in the function, I would think that you'd want to stop those before it becomes a condition or a disease and eventually becomes painful or stops you doing from what you love. And this is you know, part of our process in the office with our neurostructural examination. We test almost every single joint in the body, we test nerve function, we test lung function, we test almost everything because we want to understand how healthy is somebody. Is their spine and nervous system functioning properly? Are their joints functioning properly? Are they able to, to do a squat, to do a deadlift, to be able to function? We want to hear, of course, if somebody's in pain, we want to put that as part of our clinical picture, but it's not as important for assessing somebody's overall health because it is technically possible to be fairly healthy and to be in a lot of pain. That's, you know, cases like fibromyalgia or, or where there's central sensitization, where the nervous system becomes extremely sensitive to pain, where you have a really healthy tissue, but the pain is in the brain. And, and that's a discussion for another day. And so... I think the biggest thing that I would take away from this is that pain is in the brain and that you shouldn't judge one's health based on how we look and how we feel. And there's some more practical information. So I think pain is unfortunately a universal truth of life. I have pain, you have pain, you occasionally get some sharpness in the neck or sharpness in the back or you're walking and your knee feels weird for a second. Those are not the types of aches and pains that I worry about. There are some times where just a particular nerve gets irritated, there's some inflammation, maybe you slept poorly, maybe your brain's really, really sensitive to what's going on. I don't think you worry about those. It is that if you have something chronically painful or chronically uh, that's holding you back because it hurts, that's something you definitely need to be addressed because I can almost guarantee there's been a problem or some dysfunction for weeks, months, years, or decades. The bigger takeaway, I think, is that we want to get tested whether it's from your physician or from your manual therapist, see if your body is functioning properly before it starts to go down that cascade where you are diseased and something hurts and you're going to be held back from something that you love or worst case scenario, it's going to affect your mortality or your morbidity. So that's where testing is really important to figure out if something is functioning well and you're going to need to see a specific doctor or therapist that's comfortable with assessing somebody for performance and function and, and true health and not just looking for a disease state. And then the other thing that I think is really useful, I hope you take away from this, is that knowing that pain is not necessarily um, all coming from a nerve or a receptor somewhere in the body and that we do have some control over it, that the state of our mind, whether that's affected from our nutrition, from our sleep, 
from our cognition, our relationships, our ability to mel meditate, our ability to meditate, our satisfaction with our job, these things all affect our pain levels and they all have an interplay in terms of how something feels. And it's really funny because once we start the corrective care process with a practice member in the office, I will rarely ask them how they feel. I care, and if they want to share something with me that's new, I definitely want to know about that. But you can see I'm rarely going to adjust my approach based on what somebody tells me because if their elbow hurts, it might not reflect a problem with the elbow. We do testing in the office to make sure that we understand what's functional, what's dysfunctional, and what needs to be made healthy again with some corrections or corrective acupuncture in the office uh, and at home with some lifestyle changes. So in terms, now we're not going to talk about the, the drug stuff. We're not going to do that. Um, so in, in terms of pain, I, I hope that was helpful. Uh, I will include some really excellent uh, videos and some really cool videos from YouTube and TED Talks uh, more about pain and uh, from some PhDs and some researchers that do a really great job of explaining it. They won't do uh, the same job of you know explaining how to interpret for your knee or your elbow, but might give you some more scientific background and use some big words. So guys, I hope that today was useful. I hope you have a better, a better understanding of how pain works. If you have some pain, if you want your function assessed, make sure you either get in contact with us or find somebody in your neighborhood that's comfortable with assessing you for how healthy you are. Otherwise, I appreciate your time. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, send me an email on my email, on Facebook, on Instagram. I'm happy to reply. And I hope you guys have a lovely day.